I just think a lot of these conversations I hear about the 49ers, and I guess maybe every NFL team, sort of originate from the same mistake that so many of us make. And that is feeling like anything that we see on a given weekend has anything to do with what's going to happen the following weekend. It does, Mark. This season's over. Okay, sweet. Back to you. Where's Sandy and Goo go? <laughs> Give him, let him come back in and take over. No, it has nothing to do with what happened the week before, and it has nothing to do with what we're going to see next. So a couple things on that. First of all, as I'm heading in today, I'm listening to Steiny and Goo and even the conversation we just had with them, right? Whether the Niners win or lose, we're having a, a Brock Purdy conversation. And I've heard callers calling in all day. Well, if this is the start of some sort of a downturn for Brock Purdy, why would it be? Give me one rational reason why this train would fall off of the track. Here's what I'm actually thinking. This kind of micromanaging of your opinions with regard to any football player, Brock only an example right now, is going to wear you out. This whole thing is going to wear everybody out with regard to Brock Purdy. I can give you example after example. Oh, but Mark, only 17 points. Right, Josh Allen came out two hours later and scored 14 at home against the Giants the previous Thursday night. Patrick Mahomes scored 19 at home against the Broncos, the team that gave up 70 earlier in the year. Are they still great quarterbacks? Is anybody predicting a potential downturn for those quarterbacks because they went out and failed to get to 20 points? Why do we continue to think that when we watch one game, it means that's what we're going to see again the next week. But it means that on Tuesday, and by the time we get to Sunday, or in this case Monday, we might think differently. But in the meantime, we react to what we see. And in the NFL, everything has a greater significance and a greater import than in any, any other sport. So we look at Brock Purdy on Sunday, and he had a bad game. And the offense had a bad game. And Cleveland was better and you lose on the road, and Moody should have made the kick, and you're 5-1, and one, and that sucks, and you get to Tuesday, and you're still feeling some kind of way about Brock and the offense and the injuries, and you get to Wednesday, and you start to think, okay, well, things aren't as bad as you thought, and then Thursday, and then Friday, and then Saturday. By the time you get to Monday, the next game, normally it's Sunday, but this week it's Monday, by the time you get there, you should be in a much more rational place. And so I don't think that it wears you out. I just think it's the normal rhythm, the biorhythm of a week in the NFL where you react to your team and then you still react to your team and then you start to, you know, get through the five stages of grief. Shout out Kubler Ross and, you know, it's denial and it's anger and then you get to acceptance and then it's bargaining and all the rest of it. I think in the NFL, it's a process. Is what I'm saying. Okay. Well, of course it is. It's, it's everything. Everything is. Right. And everything on is. Tuesday, after that loss, I don't think that most fans are yet ready to well, get to the point where there's acceptance and the realization that, and I'm looking right now, NFL.com, power rankings. Uh -huh. Last week, the Niners were? <laughs> number one. Number one. This week, the Niners are? Number one. Oh, really? Number one. I watched some other platform put them at number four. Number one. The Dolphins were number two, and I laughed. Dolphins are Kansas City's two, okay. up from three. Miami's three, up from four. Detroit is four, up from five. And where are the Eagles? Five. Five. Down from two. Okay. So so that was the shakeup. So the Eagles lost, cost them, and the Niners lost, didn't. The Eagles lost to the Jets right. the way they lost to the Jets. Okay. Which was more embarrassing than the Niners. The it was Niners more had, embarrassing. I don't know if it means. It was worse. But, but it doesn't mean anything in a grand sense. Of course not. In but in of terms of they power are. rankings and the eye test, yeah. you look at that loss and you say, oh my God, Philly, how? Well, you led the whole way. And, right. And, and the Niners led for to most the, of this. Zach Wilson beat you. Yeah. But P.J. Walker beat you. The Niners, Jake Moody beat you. Okay, and I could say also with the Jets and Eagles, Zach Wilson had nothing to do with it. Somebody picked the ball off, ran to the 10. Zach turned and? around and handed it to a running back okay. who the Eagles let walk into the end zone. That's not hard. You couldn't do that. 
<laughs> Although I, I wonder, yeah, I could in the, I couldn't let a running back score on me? Yes, I could. Of all the plays in the history of the NFL that you or I could have accomplished, what Brees Hall did? What? No, what Zach Wilson did? Oh, take a snap, I snap? turn around, and hold wow. the ball out. I think I would faint before the snap. <laughs> I do. I think I would faint right? just by like those defensive players looking at me. I'm like, I'm out. I'm out. Timeout. Blue, I call timeout. Oh, blue 22. Yeah, I call timeout is what I would right. do. I'm like, they look scary. I'm going to go sit down. You guys should pick someone else to go out there. But anyway, I'm not asking for rational behavior. What kind of idiot do you think I am? I'm not asking for rational sports fandom. What are we doing here? If we're rational, we would say something like, well, let's go to a library this Sunday because we could actually maybe help the world rather than yell at our TV screen. No, I don't want rational. I just want to sort of get to that, that message. Nothing happened to the 49ers on Sunday. I'll go back to my phrase from yesterday. Frustration, not concern. So I'm not telling anybody to not be frustrated. I do think that if you have your like, oh, as if you want to pretend like you're on first take or uh, or PTI, and you want to sit, you want to wake up Monday morning and be like, I'm going to draft my take. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna be Skip Bayless for a day. Here's my take. My take is put it away. Whatever your take is, just put it away. There's no grand take to make. They lost a football game. They probably shouldn't have lost it. The Browns played phenomenal defense, and then a bunch of things happened, like injuries, poor calls. Peter King, 315, will tell you he still doesn't know how the hell that's not a fumble right before half from P.J. Walker. He says he watched it in slow motion 10 times. We all have. And cannot figure out how that's not a fumble. But are we really going to come out of it? Maybe that's my question. Are we coming out of Sunday with some sort of grand take? And if so, what is it? Because that's lost on me. Are you coming out of Sunday with some sort of like, well, now the 49ers are struggling with blank? Or, well, now they're in trouble going forward because blank? I fill in those blanks with just that blank. I got nothing. I'm concerned about nothing. I still think this is absolutely the best team in football. It stinks that key players got hurt. It's awesome that they're not badly hurt. Um, and that's where we are. That's where we are. I don't I don't have any, like, now this means blank for Brock Purdy. It means we can stop talking about when's he going to throw a pick or when's he going to lose a game. Right, both have That's it. Yeah. That's it. In terms of grand takeaways, there aren't any in terms of, well, now they are not a Super Bowl front runner, or now they aren't a good team, or now Brock Purdy's been exposed. None of that is is appropriate, and none of that's accurate. But you can look at certain things from that game and think, huh, these are things definitely to keep an eye on. For example, a good defensive front, and they'll face one in Philadelphia, can be disruptive to this offensive line. Philadelphia's got as good, if not a better defensive line as they had last year. They're deep. They're physical, and that's what Cleveland had. And I also look at the way Cleveland played Christian McCaffrey when he's able to come back. Hopefully it's this Monday, and if it's not until later in the year, what they did to Christian McCaffrey is repeatable. They bracketed him. They played him inside and outside. They brought the safety up and played McCaffrey's choice route that he likes to run where he runs out of the backfield, and he decides which way he wants to go. Well, when you have defenders on both sides – You can't throw him the ball. And Cleveland did that. Jim Schwartz, the defensive coordinator, and they took McCaffrey out of the game in that fashion. That's repeatable. Well, repeatable if you've got, in my opinion, repeatable if you have that personnel. Sure. Which I don't think almost any of the other teams in the NFL have. Almost none. Yes, there are other good defensive lines. Yeah. And yes, one of my questions for Peter absolutely will be because he did a lot of the football morning in America columns got a lot on the Niners and Browns. Oh, yeah. A lot of it's about Jim Schwartz. A lot of it's about Jake Moody. He won Goat of the Week. Congratulations. <laughs> um, but yeah, not greatest of all time. The other kind of go. Oh. Anyway, point being, one of my questions will absolutely be do you think that the 49er offensive line put something on tape that other defensive coordinators can now attack? Or. Do the Browns just have the personnel 
combined with the fact that Trent Williams was only a portion of himself. Sure. And add in elements and, you know, what have you. Great cover corners. You know, one thing that Peter wrote about is that the Browns excessively played man-to-man. They're normally his own team. Yeah. But they played a ton of man, and Denzel Ward's their best cover corner, and he loves it when they play man, and they did that, and they had a ton of success with it. Is that partially because Debo was out and C-Mac was out and Kittle was hanging back blocking? Maybe. Like, that's, wh- that's what I want to know. Did, did, was there a fly in the ointment that everybody found? My guess is no. My guess is no. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out if they're hampered by injuries going forward. But I, I do not, and I thought that that was almost kind of the lesson of the weekend. Forget just the 49er game. Look around. The Bills, like, looked awful on Sunday night. Grinder of a game. It's a win. It's a win. P.I. on the last play, not called, what have you. Eh. But a grinder against the New York Giants backup QB when their starting QB couldn't get a pass off through the first five games. And everyone went, well, nobody, but nobody could succeed at quarterback behind this offensive line. And then Terod Taylor went out there and never turned the ball over. He wasn't great, but he never turned the ball over. And he's a backup. And then the Chiefs only scored 19. And the Eagles only scored 14 and lost. And the 49ers only scored 17 and lost. The Jets are 3-3 three and three yeah. with Zach Wilson at quarterback. Correct. With wins over Jalen Hurts, Russell Wilson, and Josh Allen. So it's any given Sunday, and I know it's a cliche, but it fits. And on this given Sunday, the Browns were better than the Niners. And you could look at injuries, and that was certainly a part of it. But the Browns caused the Niners to be uncomfortable in many ways. They took away Christian McCaffrey, and he got hurt. Debo was the most active that he was in the pregame, and on the opening snap of the game, he got hurt, and Trent Williams got rolled up on, and that's just one of those things in football that happens, and once he was compromised, the offense had almost no chance. 